Let's lift up the praises of God in this house. Let's lift up praises unto God in this house. He's worthy to be praised. Could the redeemed of the Lord say so right now? Could the redeemed of the Lord say so right now? Those who have been redeemed with the mighty hand of God and his outstretched arm all across this house, could you lift up a praise that is worthy? That is fitting for the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Come on and give him praise today. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be his holy name. I feel like we ought to take a moment right now and just let it build in this house. Let that praise rise from your soul. Rise from your soul. There's a beautiful presence of the Lord in here. If you feel it, could you just kind of give him a wave offering? Could you do that? Just kind of wave your hand before the Lord in this house. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that we feel your presence. We thank you that you're in this house. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all, Lord. And we give you the praise. I wonder if we could clap our hands unto him in this place and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Come on, that's it. From front to back, from side to side. Just lift up your voice and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. Bless his holy name. What a joy it is to be in the house of God this morning at the Pentecostals of Alexandria. If you're glad to be here, could you give him another praise today? We are a blessed people to be able to join together in this house. God bless the worship team and the singers and the musicians. Could we give them a great big hand clap, ushering us into the presence of the Lord? We are so delighted to be here at the great Pentecostals of Alexandria. We give honor to the Mangan family. Can we do that today? Give honor to this great family. We love you and honor you. Amen. Pastor Gentry and Sister Lexi Mangan, God bless you in the name of the Lord. Thankful for your voice. Amen. Lifted like a trumpet in this generation, in this hour. And we're thankful for that. Brings the grace of God and boldness that is needed in this day and hour. And we're thankful to them for it. And Bishop Anthony Mangan, Sister Mickey Mangan, we love you both so very much. God bless you. So appreciative. And we're so thankful to be able to be part of the 40th because of the times. What a landmark milestone moment that is. And we honor you for your vision for this great conference that it is impossible to quantify how many lives, eternities, souls have been changed by this great conference. This conference is an oasis for thousands of ministers around the world and churches. It's just an amazing thing to see how many ministries have come into this place in need of a touch from God. And they take what they receive from here and go far and wide preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we honor you, Bishop and Sister Mangan and Pentecostals of Alexandria. Thank you for the sacrifices you make annually to make this possible. It's just a blessing to all. And Sister Vesta Lane Mangan, God bless you. We're so thankful. You look wonderful. And we thank God for the hand of his healing upon you. And we're looking forward to hearing you preach the word of God this week. Amen. And we love you so much. And I'm so grateful to have my family here. I've got my whole family with me today. And we're so thankful 
to be able to be at the POA and uh, to see all of you. I do want to say how glad I am to see my aunt and uncle, brother and sister McKellar. We love you and honor you. God bless you. Amen. Love you. Sister Tenny, we love you. God bless you in the name of the Lord. And I'm glad to see all of God's people gathered here. God bless each and every one of you. Could we give just everybody a great big hand? Thank the Lord. It is good to be in the house of God, and I am so thankful to be able to stand in this pulpit. I, I'm just so honored. I do want to give a shout out to Tree of Life in Cincinnati, because they're all going to be watching. They watch Pentecostals of Alexandria every week, and I'm so thankful for that. You're a blessing to people around the world, and we're honored to be here today. And I'm going to look to the word of the Lord this morning, and will invite your attention to the book of 2 Kings. I'm going to read from the 23rd chapter. 2 Kings and the 23rd chapter. And I want to read to you just a few verses of Scripture here in your hearing. And there's a little, there's a little history happening here in these passages of Scripture that I just want to take a moment and try to, to dissect and extract a very important principle that I think applies to where we are living. 2 Kings 23, verse 4, the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest and the priests of the second order, the keepers of the door, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem and the fields of Kidron, carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah, in the places round about Jerusalem, them also that burned incense to Baal, the sun, the moon, the planets, to all the host of heaven. He brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem under the brook Kidron and burned it at the brook Kidron, stamped it small to powder, cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. He break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in the entering in of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on a man's left hand at the gate of the city. I'm going to read from verse number 14 as well. The scripture says he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. Moreover, the altar that was at Bethel in the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, had made both that altar and the high place. He break down and burned the high place, stamped it small to powder and burned the grove. And as Josiah turned himself, he spied the sepulchers that were there in the mount and sent and took the bones out of the sepulchers and burned them upon the altar and polluted it. According to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. Then he said, what title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, it is the sepulcher of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaimed these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone. Let no man move his bones. Leave his bones alone. Let no man move them. So they did. They let his bones alone, which the bones of the prop, with the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. I want to speak to you for just a few moments this morning on this subject, buried with the bones of the prophet. Buried with the bones of the prophet. Could we lift up our voices unto God and ask his blessing upon the preaching of his word today? Lord, I thank you that you are in this house and that your word is here to heal. That your word is here to save. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Move upon us. Help us to receive your word this morning. Help us, oh God, to draw closer to you. We give you all glory and honor. We honor you and ask your anointing upon the preaching of the word today. That we may hear it, receive it, and obey it in the name of the Lord. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's word. As Joseph was preparing to pass from this life, he gathered his children around him, that great man, that great patriarch, who had welcomed all the world into Egypt where he had so wisely stewarded uh, the agricultural efforts of Egypt in such a way that there was food for all the world to receive. 
Namely, the people of Israel came up, Jacob and his children. And now Joseph was in the latter stages of his life and was ready to pass on. But before he did, he gave one final admonition to his children. He said to them, we will not be in Egypt forever. We are here but for a while. And he said, I I am ending my life here, but I want to go with you when you go where God is taking his people. And he said, Don't leave my bones behind when you leave Egypt. Carry my bones with you. And this was important because Joseph knew that that bones were the, the final physical representation of a life that was lived. There are, there are many things associated with a life that is lived physically upon this earth, but at the end of it all, not much is kept. The bones are about all that is left, physically speaking. This is why we, even in our efforts to, to commemorate lives and memorialize them, we find a resting place for the bones. I remember running through a cemetery as a child and being told, you gotta, can't run through the cemetery because there are bones here. These are sacred grounds, and you have to be respectful of those whose bones lie in these grounds. And it was an unusual concept as a child, but, but it's what we do. It's all we have left. We don't have anything left. Nothing else lasts, but the bones, they last. My wife is from Germany and, uh, and spent several years in Luxembourg growing up. And uh, we visit there uh, as much as we can. And we were in Luxembourg looking out over the American military cemetery. And there, dotting that great landscape were the white crosses that commemorate the lives of those who gave their lives to deliver that great continent and the world from the tyranny of Adolf Hitler. And I thought, how fitting it is that we have found a place to commemorate these bones. Bones of people who gave their lives for me, and I don't even know them and they don't know me. But we honor their bones, and this is, this is what we do. We, it's all we have left, because when everything fades away, physically speaking, the bones, they survive. Solomon was the wisest man that ever walked the earth, except for Jesus Christ. Jesus let us know, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. But Solomon was wise. His wisdom was excellent. He, of course, constructed the magnificent or exceeding magnificent temple of the Lord. And it caused the queen of the south to come from the uttermost parts of the earth. But when she arrived, she said the half had not been told. Solomon was wise until he wasn't. When he got old, he turned his heart away from the Lord And he began to serve other gods. This angered God and God began to turn things away from Solomon. He was going to pull the kingdom away from the house of David. There was a man by the name of Jeroboam. And Jeroboam, the Bible says, was an industrious man. This man was loyal to Solomon. He was the son of Nebat. The prophet Ahijah told Jeroboam, under the unction of the Lord's anointing, he said that God is going to give to you, if you'll have it, the kingdom of David. And he will allow you to have the blessings of David if you will walk in the ways of David, your father. And Jeroboam had a profound anointing upon his life and a favor from God should he want it. Solomon realized this and turned on Jeroboam and drove him out. Jeroboam ran off to Egypt and and he was trying to find some kind of shelter in Egypt. And when Solomon passed away, Rehoboam came onto the scene, the son of Solomon, at which time Jeroboam returned. When he returned, he said to Rehoboam, he said, listen, he said, I want to come home, but I know I can't come home if you're going to be like King Solomon. He said, King Solomon was fierce. Even though Jeroboam had a prophecy on his life, all he really wanted was peace. He said, I want to come home, but if you're fierce like King Solomon, then I can't. If you'll be good to us, we would like to come home and and, and serve you. And, And Rehoboam took counsel with his elders and took counsel with his peers and said, how should I handle this? Jeroboam, whom King Solomon drove out, has asked to return home. The elders wisely said, your father was a harsh man. You should be kind and gracious unto Jeroboam. But he rejected the advice of the elders. His peers with whom he had grown up said to him, 
Your father whipped them with whips. You ought to whip them with scorpions. And so Rehoboam said, I'm not going to be nice to you. You want to come back here? The Bible says he answered them harshly and roughly. And to this, Jeroboam said, I can't have anything to do with this. He fled again, and all of Israel fled. And in that moment, the kingdom of Israel divided. And the Lord took from Solomon ten tribes of Israel, the house of David. And Rehoboam lost the kingdom of Israel. Now he was the king of Judah and there was a kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Israel anointed Jeroboam to be their king. And now God was ready to give the blessings of David over unto Jeroboam. But Jeroboam was stricken with a terrible insecurity. He was afraid that the children of Israel would return to Jerusalem as they do and they must. And when they would return to Jerusalem and do sacrifices unto the Lord, he said, it could be that their hearts would be turned again to the Lord. And he said, I can't have them walking into Jerusalem and getting around all of that holy city and memories start flooding their mind. I can't have them get amongst their brothers and their sisters and begin to remember the God who delivered their fathers out of Egypt. You let them hear the Shema a few times. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Him only shall you serve. You shall love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he said, I, I'm afraid that their heart would be turned back unto the God that they their fathers served. And so Jeroboam concocted a terrible scheme. It was a horrible idea. And it was a slap in the face of God who offered him such kind favor. He said, I'm going to build two golden calves. I'm going to put one in Bethel, which is actually right next to Jerusalem. Very close to Jerusalem. So close, you really got to know where you are. If you're going to get into Bethel, you, you can slide over into Jerusalem before you even know it. And, and yet Dan is the other place where he put the next golden calf. And Dan is as far in Israel as you can go and still be in Israel. It's at the northern coast. So he said, I've got two golden calves. And I'm going to situate them in such a way that the children of Israel, from anywhere they are, can worship them. If they're close to Bethel, if they're close to Dan, they can go worship one of these golden calves. And I'm going to force them to worship their God at these golden calves. And I'm going to do it on the 15th day of the eighth month of every year so that when they would typically go to Jerusalem, I'm going to tell them, no, 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 no. You don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. You just go to Bethel or to Dan and, and, and you can worship there. And we need to be wary of false teaching that tells us we don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. You ought to thank God every day for a pastor who preaches to you. You've got to go back to the upper room. You've got to go to Jerusalem. We thank God that we know the truth of repentance and baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. We've got to go all the way to Jerusalem. Bethel won't do. Dan won't do. But Jeroboam said, we'll get it in Bethel and we'll get it in Dan. And these are two types of idolatries, but they're idolatry nonetheless. Dan is as far from Jerusalem as you can get. It's far out. It's way out. It's, it's no question you're not in Jerusalem. But Bethel, Bethel's so close to Jerusalem, you might get confused and might actually think you're where you need to be. There are two different types of idolatry, and you've got to be wary of both of them. And understand the truth of God's Word. And understand that the devil's devices are deceptive. And they are designed to bring you down and deprive you of the promises of God in your life. Hallelujah. And so it was that, that Jeroboam created these two golden calves. It angered God. God was righteously indignant at this. He had offered Jeroboam so much, so many blessings, and instead of Jeroboam receiving them with gratitude and faith, he turns around and establishes an idolatry that is against God and builds these golden calves and forces Israel to worship at these golden calves instead of going to Jerusalem and worshiping the Lord. 
And it made God so angry that he began to move upon the mind of a young prophet in Judah. And he said to this young prophet, I want you to go and cry against that altar in Bethel. I'm going to stir up this young prophet. He said, now, I don't want you to stop anywhere on the way there. I don't want you to stop anywhere on the way back. I want you to go to Bethel. Don't go eat. Don't go drink. Don't stop for lunch. Don't go anywhere but where I tell you to go. Walk into Bethel and cry against that altar. And you tell Jeroboam that I have seen his idolatry. And I'm going to bring his idolatry all the way down. And this young prophet from Judah, he just up and starts moving to Bethel. He does exactly as the Lord told him. He walks straight into Bethel, cries against that altar, and says, The Lord has spoken against this altar. Oh, altar, Jeroboam, you hear me. The Lord has seen this idolatry, and he's going to bring this idolatry down, and he's going to raise up a king. And he named that king. He said his name is Josiah, and Josiah is going to rise up. Now, this is a long time before Josiah came, but, but he called him by name. His name is going to be Josiah, and he's going to tear down this altar, and he's going to tear down everything that comes from this altar. And Jeroboam is trying to offer incense at the altar, and he looks back at this guy like, who do you think, do you, do you understand that I am the king? And he lifts up his hands and basically say, arrest this man. And when he did, his hand withered. And he actually couldn't draw it back into himself. And the fear of God came on him. He realized that the Lord had just confirmed the word of the prophet. And the ashes, the altar rent open and the ashes of the altar fell out. It frightened Jeroboam. And he realized, I have sinned against God. He said, oh, would you ask that the Lord would heal my withered hand? The young prophet besought the Lord and the Lord healed the withered hand. King Jeroboam looks at the young prophet and said, okay, okay, wait, 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 this is a little much. I need you to come to my house and eat bread with me and refresh yourself and let's talk about what just happened and, and I need to know more about what you're saying. The young prophet said, no can do, have special instructions. I've got to come this way and do what I just did and now I gotta get back home. But, but God bless you, hope you're doing well and I hope you remember what I told you today. And, and he leaves and when he, when he leaves, word started spreading throughout Israel and word reached the ears of an old prophet. And the old prophet heard that there was a young prophet that spoke a word of prophetic unction to Jeroboam about this altar in Bethel. And the old prophet heard the word and he heard that there was a judgment coming upon it. And the old prophet said, I do I didn't like that altar to begin with. I knew that was going to be a bad idea. I knew we should have never had one of those, those altars, that golden calf, like Jeroboam was building in Bethel. And he said, I got to talk to this guy. And so he goes and finds the young prophet. They meet him. And he says, finds him sitting under an oak tree. And he said, I want you to come to my house, man. I hear you're the young prophet, right? That spoke truth to Jeroboam. And the young prophet said, I am. He said, I want you to come to my house. I got to hear more about this. The young prophet said, I can't do that. He said, the Lord told me to come to Bethel and to go right back to Judah. And the old prophet was almost, he was almost offended that, that like there was something wrong with his house or something. And listen, you've got to be mindful of people's personal convictions. When the Lord told them to do something, it may not apply to you, but if he told them to do it, then they need to do it. And the old prophet said, well, what's wrong with my house? He said, I'm a prophet too. And the angel of the Lord appeared to me and told me to come tell you to come to my house. But the Bible said he lied about that. The young prophet goes to the old prophet's house. They sit down and they're talking. And while they're talking, the old prophet, I can just hear him in my imagination saying to the young prophet, now tell me more about this. His name is Josiah. Will I live to see him? When is he coming? And what year is this going to be? And what all is he going to do again? And while they're talking, the Bible says that the Lord did speak to the old prophet. And the old prophet rose up and said, oh man, oh man, you made a bad mistake. You should have never listened to me. You got to get out of here and get out of here now. You're going to meet a lion on the way and, and you're going to lose your life tonight. And, and the, the, the young prophet gets up and, and moves away and he did. He meets a lion on the way. The lion kills him 
And here's the thing about personal convictions. This is why when God tells you something that may not make sense to you, but you need to go ahead and do it, it's because God knows where the lions are. There's some stuff God will tell us to do and we're like, man, that just doesn't make any sense so I'm not gonna do it. You better do it because God knows where the lions are and he'll order your steps and it doesn't have to make sense to us. We've got to remember he is God and God alone. He is the king of all kings. He is the Lord of all lords. He knows where the lions are. And so, so the young prophet he is, he is killed by this lion. And as bypassers would go along the way, they would see that, that carcass of that young prophet. And word started spreading that there was, there was a dead body that was mutilated by a lion and that the lion was still there. And it was a, it was a big talk in town. Now the old prophet hears about it. And he goes out to see it. He said, I know it's got to be that young prophet because I knew God was going to judge him. And so he goes out to where the young prophet is and he sees this devastating scene of this, this body that's been mutilated by the lion. And as he stands there looking at it, he's thinking, man, what a tragedy this is. And I can only imagine that he felt some sort of responsibility. I'm the one that got him off track. I'm the one that led him astray. I'm the one that told him it didn't matter that he listened to God about this and about that. And so as he's looking at him, he's thinking to himself, man, what a tragedy and what an anointing. What a ministry he had. What a prophecy he gave at just the right time. And it's going to come to pass. It was the word from the Lord. And as he, as he stand there looking at this, at this scene, he gets this idea. He said, listen, to his servants, he said, listen, I want you to pick up his body and I want you to go bury him in my sepulcher that I have. Go bury him and, and when you do, mark the grave. And, and I want you to put on a plaque who it is that's inside that grave. Because when I die, I want you to bury me with the bones of the prophet. One book and nine chapters later, there is an eight-year-old boy, anointed king. His name is Josiah. Long time has passed. Many years have passed. And Josiah is now the king. And here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. The idolatry in Israel and in Judah has gone like wildfire. It's not just two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in Dan. No, it's idols on every high hill. It's idols under every green tree. It's idols all over the marketplace. It's idols in every living room. It's idols in every home. The people are completely completely given over to Baal and to Ashtaroth and to Molech and to all the gods of the heathens. It has spread. It has become a cancer, a malignancy in Israel. And Josiah is eight years old and the anointing of God comes upon this young child. He doesn't even fully understand what's all about to happen. But God foretold this day through a young prophet many years prior. And the Bible says that Josiah decides to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord. And he says, go on in and get inside the house of the Lord and let's repair it. Let's, let's fix it up. It's been too long since we've used the house of God. And so they go in and they're starting to try to fix it up a little bit, spruce it up a little bit, remove some of the boards and the cobwebs. And, and as, they're, as they're bringing in the carpenters and the masons and all that will be involved in this project, Hilkiah the high priest makes a discovery. There are many people who believe and there's a high probability that Hilkiah the high priest was the father of Jeremiah the prophet. And Jeremiah the prophet, of course, that great prophet to Israel. But Hilkiah, his father's name was Hilkiah and he was a priest. This Hilkiah the priest said, I have found something in the temple of the Lord and I want the king to read it. It's an old ancient scroll that we should have been reading every year in the ears of the people but it has gone forgotten, it has gone unnoticed. And they bring that scroll, that scroll to King Josiah. 
He orders his scribes to unfurl that old ancient scroll and start reading the words of the law of God. And here are the words of the law of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And all of a sudden, it hits Josiah. My goodness, we are in total violation of what the law of our fathers has stipulated to us. Read on, read on. He read on and it said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and him only shall you serve. You shall love him with all of your heart. You shall love him with all of your soul. You shall love him with all of your strength. And Josiah realized we have completely abandoned the law and the word and the will of God. And an indignation started building inside of that righteous king. And the wheels of prophecy, an old prophecy, an ancient utterance of a prophetic word, those wheels began to go into motion. Josiah said, I want you to get me ready. We're going out into the nation and we're going to execute the wrath and the vengeance of God. We're going to tear down every idol. We're going to remove every statue. We're going to break down every image. We're going to desecrate everything that the enemy has erected. In the 18th year of King Josiah, he goes out into Israel with an anointed indignation of God. And he's looking around and he said, I don't want any trace of this heathen idolatry in the land of God's heritage any longer. I don't want anybody talking about Molech. I don't want anybody talking about Baal Peor or Baal Berith or Baal Zebub. I don't want anybody talking about Ashtoreth. I want it all removed. It down off of that high hill. Get it out from underneath that green tree. Get in their houses and pull it out of their home. He took those idols and he burned them. He ground them down to powder and he burned them and he, he began to melt them in the fire and he, he told the priests, he said, y'all better get out of here. He began to execute the wrath of God. He had a wild look in his eye as he came to the sepulchers of those old priests who for so long had misled the people of God. And he said, open up those graves, these graves that hold the bones of these priests and prophets of Israel in those years. He said, we memorialize those bones, but no more will we memorialize those bones. I want that memory gone. I want it erased from the earth. Get those bones out here and grind them down to powder and we're going we're gonna to sweep them into the, into the dustbin of history. And, and as he begins to do this, he's pulling bones out. They got skeletons dragged out of these sepulchers and he's burning them and grinding them down and they come to an old sepulcher and there's this little plaque on the, on the wall next to the sepulcher and, and he, they couldn't read it. It was so ancient. It had been so long that they had to find a specialist who had this language and said, said, could you read this? What does this actually say? And they're reading it and they're looking through their bivocals and they're trying to figure out what it is that's being said. And they said, oh, king, inside this sepulcher are the bones of a young prophet. He's from Judah. Apparently, he prophesied that a man named Josiah would be king. Inside this grave are the bones of a young prophet who said you would do what you are doing right now. And Josiah said, he did? They said, yeah. He said, I would do what I'm doing right now? Yeah. He's a good guy? Yeah, he's one of the good guys. Leave his bones alone. I could just see him turn to walk away and they said, wait, there's another set of bones in here. He said, well, leave those bones alone too. If he's with that other guy, then we're not going to touch either one of those bones. Oh, that old prophet knew exactly what he was doing. As he looked at that dead body on the road that day, he said, 
I know, I know that his prophecy isn't popular right now. I know his declaration that we are to worship only one God isn't popular right now. I know his message of holiness unto the Lord isn't popular right now. I know he's getting canceled right now. I know that right now... It's not popular what he was saying, but there's coming a day when everything else will be lost and what he said will stand the test of time. All of these other priests and all of these other prophets, uh, false prophets and false teachers and false preachers and false priests, they're all going to be removed and desecrated and forgotten. But this man, his message is going to stand the test of time and eternity. Go bury him in my tomb because when I die, I want to be buried with the bones of this prophet. I've come to preach to the church of 2024. Hallelujah. We're not even 2023. 2023 sounded like a long time from 1990, but, but 2024, we're here, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm preaching to a people. We're surrounded by a strange world. And we're surrounded by strange principalities and powers. And I know serving God is unpopular right now. And I know speaking in tongues isn't popular right now. And I know Jesus name baptism isn't popular right now and I know holy living isn't popular right now but you better get buried with it you better immerse yourself into it because there's coming a day you hear what I'm telling you the judgment of God is coming upon this earth and I don't plan to be a part of what God is going to judge. I'm going to be buried with the bones. Huh? I'm going to get, I'm going to get tied into something that's going to stand when the world is on fire. Don't you get caught up in it, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let this culture deceive you into thinking that it's going to always be this way. Hallelujah. There is a highway called holiness. There is a place called heaven. Hallelujah. There is a name, and his name is above every name. And at that name, every knee shall bow. And at that name, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You better worship him and only him. You better buy the truth and sell it not. You got to get a hold of something that lasts. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you some bones that last, that stand for eternity. I'm going to tell you that the Word of God stands for eternity. You hear what I'm telling you? You better get a hold of this book. They've tried to burn it. They can't burn enough of it. It just keeps reemerging. They've tried to ban it. They can't ban it. It just keeps reemerging. They can outlaw it. We'll smuggle it in. This book is going to stand and has stood the test of time and eternity. I thank God for every miracle in this book and for every miracle I have seen and see. But if I never see another miracle, I'm standing on the promises of this book. I thank God for every prophecy that has come to pass. But if another prophecy, if I don't see one more come to pass, I'm still going to stand on the promises of this book. The principles are sure. The principles are steadfast. I've tried them and discovered them. They work. I'm going to tell you something. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
Hallelujah, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit into the joints and marrow of the bone and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in the heaven. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You better get a hold of this book and never let go of it. I'm going to tell you what, CNN is going to fade away. ABC is going to fade away. NBC, CBS, NBA, NFL, MLB, NCAA, FBI, FDA, LGBTQIA. You hear everything. The only thing that's going to stand is the B-I-B-L-E. And that is the book for me. When it's all said and done, everything, the RNC, the DNC, you've got to get a hold of the Word of God. Because it's going to stand when everything else is shaken. You hear the word of the Lord. Everything that can be shaken shall be shaken. But we shall not be shaken. We shall not be shaken. Our God, our refuge, our fortress, his name is a strong tower. We shall not be shaken. Get a, hold of, get a hold of these bones that are going to last. Hallelujah. You know, you know what's going to last? The church is going to last. Hallelujah. I said the church is going to last. The body of Christ is going to stand the test of time and eternity. When everything else is burned like the chaff, the ungodly driven away with the wind, but, but, but he, hallelujah, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in, the, standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted, planted, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away I want to get a hold of something that the wind can't drive away I want to get a hold of something that winds of doctrine cannot toss to and fro I I want to get a hold I thank God for the church people mock the church but the church is gonna stand People will ridicule you for bringing your family to church, but the church is going to stand. I know we're not perfect. I know we're not perfect. And there is such a thing as church hurt, God forbid, but it's still the bride of Christ, and it will stand the test of time. And I thank God for the Pentecostals of Alexandria who set the gold standard in apostolic ministry to be a light, hallelujah, in this dark world. You better get a hold of the Pentecostals of Alexandria and never let go because the church it's going to stand. When everything shakes and shifts, the church is going to stand. Woo, hallelujah. I'm talking about the church in the book of Revelation, built on the rock, on a firm foundation. It's been through the flood. It's been through the fire. But one of these days, this church, this church is going to move up a little higher. It's the church triumphant, and it's built by the hand of the Lord. Yeah. You know, they came to the body of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. And they were going to break his legs. They were going to break his bones. But when they got to his body, he had already given up the ghost. And it didn't matter how many men tried to break those bones. They wouldn't have been able to break those bones because those bones were fortified by an old prophecy that a bone of his 
shall not be broken. I'm going to tell you something about the body of Christ. The body of Christ might get a stomach cramp every now and then, but a bone shall not be broken. He might have been wounded for our transgressions, but a bone shall not be broken. He might have been chastised. He might have been smitten, stricken of God and afflicted, but a bone shall not be broken. This body shall not be broken. This body is going to stand the test of time. No, I'm sorry, you can't offend me out of the church. You can't backbite me out of the church. You can't rumor mill me out of the church. You can't gossip me out of the church. You can't church hurt me out of the church. I'm in the church. This is my people. This is my, this is my home. This is where I, I know I'm going to heaven with y'all. I said, I'm going to heaven with y'all. I'm not going to let deception stop me from going to heaven with you. Oh, I feel like somebody's getting a hold of something. I feel like somebody's making up in their mind. I'm going to get a hold of something that lasts. God bless you, POA. God bless you, every child care volunteer. I said, God bless you, every child care volunteer. This week, our family is going to be blessed by the child care ministry of Because of the Times. God bless all of you who serve food. God bless all of you who work in the parking lot. God bless all of you. Your hospitality is like a wind of refreshing upon ministries throughout the world. You're anointed with it. You're gifted with it. You know why? Because you've decided, I'm going to be caught up with something that's going to stand when the whole world is rocking and reeling. And we'll be in the church. The church is going to stand. The word is going to stand. You know what lasts for eternity? Prayer. 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 Those prayers ascend into the heavens continually before the Lord. Like a sweet incense, they come up before the Lord. Prayers you pray today will be in heaven for eternity. They are continually and constantly coming up before the Lord. You never go wrong when you pray. And I'm going to tell you what else never stops. Worship. Ah, John peered into the eternities and he said, I saw 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands around the throne saying, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. What you're doing right now when you clap those hands, what you're doing right now when you lift up a voice of shout unto God, what you're doing right now when you say hallelujah, Hallelujah! Thank God! Those songs we sang, they're in the heavens right now, circulating in the presence and the glory of God. It lasts. It lives on. The church, the word, prayer, praise, salvation. It lives on. Get a hold of what lasts. I'm reaching for somebody today who maybe you feel like you've already just died a thousand deaths. Maybe you feel like all hope and help is gone. But my Bible tells me that there was a, there was a man who was thrown into the grave of an old prophet. When the, when the, when the life had already gone out of his being... There was no breath left in his body. He was dead. He was absolutely 100% dead. But they knew the only way to bring something back to life is to bury it with the bones of the prophet. Put it into something that's going to last forever. And they threw that dead body into the grave of that old prophet Elisha. And those old anointed bones had one more miracle left in them. That double portion of Elijah's anointing was waiting for one more need.
hallelujah. And when that dead body touched those old anointed bones, the dead heart started beating. And those dead lungs started breathing. And that dead blood started flowing. And that those dead eyes popped open. And that dead man came to life. And I want you to know that if you'll be buried with these bones today, that dead marriage can come back to life. And you who are dead in trespasses and sins can come back to life. You can pray some prayers you thought were dead. You can have some hope you thought was dead. You can have some faith you thought was dead. If you believe it, lift up your hands and lift up your voice and give God the praise. Come on, stand with me right now and lift up your hands unto the Lord. I wonder if somebody can do something eternal right now and fill this house with praise. 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 I want to open these altars right now for somebody who's made up in their mind. I'm not going to I'm not going to stand around while the world does what they do. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to get buried with something that stands forever. Come on, that's it, that's it. If you've never repented of your sins, come to do it right now. Hallelujah, if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, today would be the day to be buried with him by baptism into his death, that you may rise to walk in newness of life. Come on, as you come, lift up a praise unto God all across this house. Lift up a praise unto God all across this house. Lift up a praise unto God across this house. Hear me now, hear me. I feel in the Holy Ghost. I feel something in the Holy Ghost. There are hundreds and thousands of ministries that are coming through Alexandria and they have for 40 plus years to receive something from the word and spirit of God and you have been the vessel that God has used to provide that to them. I'm praying a wind of refreshing come upon each and every person right now. A wind of holy refreshing to come upon you and give you strength in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus that the spirit of the Living God would move upon you and your home and your families and your mind and your spirit and your body in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Thank you for that message, Lord. Thank you for speaking to this church, Lord. Thank you for giving us a word today, Jesus. Let's make that fresh commitment today. I hope you're next to your family. You're with your family. Why don't you commit today? Let's all make a fresh commitment. We're going to be buried with some bones. We're not leaving some things. 
There are some things that have built us and shaped us and molded us. We're not going to be leaving those things. When this world is turned into chaos and fire is falling, we are going to be buried with some bones, some steady bones, some firm foundational bones. Let's commit once again afresh and new. This church, this body of believers, we're not leaving truth. We're not leaving holiness. We're not separating ourselves from those things that have built us and shaped us. Prayer and fasting and holy lifestyle, godly living. The world can go any way it wants to go. But it's going to be burned up here soon and very soon because the Lord's soon to come. Let's make a fresh commitment today. Whatever you ask us to do, Lord, wherever you ask us to go, Whatever you want from us, we turn it over to you. We make a fresh commitment to you today, God. We're going to stand on your book. We're going to stand firm on the truth of God. Hallelujah. Grab your family if they're next to you. Grab your family if they're next to you. Pray over them. Pray a prayer of commitment with your family. I pray over the priests of the home right now, God, who have to leave their home. Whether that's a husband and a father, maybe it's a single parent. Be with them, God. Give us the fortitude. Give us the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to lead our families and direct our families during this time and season, during this chaotic world. I pray over the leaders of our homes, God. Let us remember that we are built on Jesus Christ, the firm foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. I want to be buried with that. I don't ever want to leave it. When I die, I want to be known as a man who died loving and believing in truth, believing in the Word of God, proud to be a part of the church. I commit to you today, God. Commit my life, commit my family. You and you only shall we serve. Praise God. Praise God. What a word from the Lord for us today. What a word from the Lord for us today. Committed to it. Praise God. He's already mentioned it. If you haven't repented of your sins, today is your day. You haven't been baptized in Jesus' name. Obeyed the Word of God. Today is your day. We'd love to see you baptized in Jesus' name. If you haven't received the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence in speaking in other tongues, today is your day to speak in a heavenly language and let God fill you with His Spirit. It is a free gift that belongs to you. If you haven't had those things happen in your life, we would love to pray with you. To this great church, Thank you for being here today. I pray that we are committed to what was spoken over us today. We're going to be buried with that. That's what this church believes and will continue to believe. We need you this week. More than ever, we need you this week. We need your prayer. Please be praying for us this week. It's a very, very important week. Please be praying for us that have to speak and those that have to lead this week, that God will lead us, guide us, direct us, that Bishop and I, during those services, will know what to do, how to do it, when to do it, that God will speak to us, lead us, guide us, and direct us. Thank you, thank you for your prayers, your sacrifice, everything that you give. We need you this week, though, to give a little bit more. If you could pray just a little extra, if you could uh, push away from the table for a day or two, we would greatly appreciate your prayer your fasting and your sacrifice. Thank you for all you give as we move into this week. God bless you. You're a great group of people. Those of you watching online, we love you tremendously. Thank you for joining us. May God bless you. Make sure you're buried with those bones, this apostolic doctrine. Don't leave it. Don't turn from it during this wicked day and age. Thank you for being with us. Those of you that are volunteering this week, I will see you in the